Stephen Biggs, who's um, going to be talking about edible gardening in the urban landscape. Steve has um, has really focused on education and communication and inspiring folks to get involved in gardening and um, farming from an urban perspective. And he his credibility has been built up through years of dedicated uh, partnerships and and contributions in terms of magazine writing. Um, he's a, a well a sought after um, speaker and uh, a longtime supporter of uh, the uh, whole dynamics of garden writing. So um, in, in reflection of the relationship between the Garden Writers Association and the Compost Council of Canada, Steve has has helped us greatly in terms of promoting the Plant a Row, Grow a Row program as well as our Harvest Celebration Supalicious. And, uh, and so thanks very much, Steve, for making yourself available. And Jolene, if you could just um, do your fabulous technical um, overview, that would be great. And we'll turn it over to Steve. Hi, it's Jolene Rutter from Green Manitoba. Just a quick note on the questions. We'll, uh, there'll be time at the end of the presentation to give them. You can either type them into the chat uh, section below, and I'll read them aloud for you. Or there is a little hand to click on. Um, if you click on that, I will unmute your uh, microphone, and you will be able to ask the question yourself to Stephen. Uh, with that, uh, thank you, Stephen, for giving this presentation. Good. Well, uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jolene. I came home to a very wonderful telephone message a couple years ago. And the message went something like this. Mr. Biggs, you don't know me, but I know you. And so, of course, I, I was wondering, hmm, where's this going? And, and it continued, Mr. Biggs, I've knocked on your door and there's been nobody home. And so finally, I talked to your neighbor, Stephen, to get your phone number. And I, I must know the name of that Promethean plant in your front yard. Now, as a gardener, I was very delighted about this message because I'm always happy when my garden inspires people. And uh, this, this neighbor wanted to know about this Promethean, this bold and daring plant uh, in, in my front yard. And as a writer, I was happy to learn that new word, Promethean. And so, it went very nicely because uh, I said to her, well, I have some uh, seedlings that you can have. And she brought over some beautiful chocolate chip cookies that I shared with my kids. This Promethean plant, this bold and daring plant that uh, caused someone to leave me a message like that was an edible. And there's a story about how that edible ended up in my front yard. You see, there's a, a vacant lot not too far where, from where I am in Toronto. And um, this vacant lot was overgrown, long grass, garbage. And there was a community meeting that was uh, to talk about putting a vegetable garden, a community vegetable garden, on this site. And so I went, and it was a good meeting. But uh, I came home feeling surprised because a couple of the uh, neighbors who attended were dead set against this community vegetable garden. And they were worried it might affect their property values. They were worried that it wouldn't look nice. And so I came home thinking, well, how absurd, because edibles can be so beautiful. And I thought, what can I do? And maybe I should write an article. But then I got thinking, hey, I've got all that grass in my front yard. Why don't I grow vegetables? And so I started mulling over this idea of putting in a front yard vegetable garden. I was nervous because uh, the neighborhood where I live has a lot of grass in front of homes, lots of driveway, lots of shrubs, but certainly not a lot of long-haired people growing vegetables in the front yard. And as the newcomer to the uh, street, I didn't want to offend anybody. Uh, but my wife, Shelley, finally one day, she put her arm on my shoulder and she said, hey, Steve, I think they know you're eccentric. Just plant your vegetable garden. And so bit by bit, um, I, I started work on this garden. And um, you can see here, uh, this is the beginnings of it. And uh, I have uh, started to peel back the grass. And um, I've put in a bit of split rail fence, put in a couple uh, big rocks to make it a bit decorative. But it's looking pretty bare. And I'm, I'm pretty nervous at this point. Now, 
fast forward a little while, you can see I've peeled away more of the grass and I have a few little plants in there. My kids said to me, hey dad, let's, uh, let's put in a flagstone circle, which we did, but still looking pretty barren. And, um, but uh, no, no angry neighbors. So uh, fast forward to later in the summer and all of a sudden this is what I had. It looked pretty good and I hadn't upset anybody. There's some hot peppers in there, some sunflowers, some amaranth, tomatoes, cucumbers, all, all edibles except for the odd flower that I tucked in just uh, for the looks. But uh, it, it looked really nice. And, uh, and as well as that, it was a wonderful social experiment because I got to meet more neighbors uh, from putting in this garden than I had in the previous year or two on that street. Now, um, just a little bit about the way I garden. So I live in an urban area. I live in Toronto and uh, I am lucky enough to have a decent yard where I can garden in the ground and you can see at the top there one of my uh, gardens, my big veggie garden, but I also garden in containers. So on the right you're looking at uh, some of my um, rooftop garden. I have a flat roof garage which has been wonderful for gardening. So I garden in the ground in containers and I garden with my kids. That's a big part of my life right now and I find they're always eager to help even though it might not be quite what I have in mind. Here when I was pouring concrete, they wanted to get in there with the Tonka trucks and move aggregate. Um, sometimes they're doing things like collecting bugs. But anyway, I, I'm a big fan of getting kids into the garden. Now talking about edibles today, I'd like to come at it from a few different ways. And uh, if one of the things I talk about doesn't appeal to you, uh, I hope another one will. So we'll talk about edibles to grow for their looks. Uh, edibles that have a very strong ornamental value. From there I'll go on to edibles that are very simple to grow. Third, I'll talk about things that are fun, like that Promethean plant, things that will get neighbors calling you, knocking on your door. We'll go on from there to talk about edibles, that uh, how to fit edibles into tight spots. If you don't have a lot of gardening space, you can still grow edibles. We'll talk about front yards. And then um, we'll finish off talking about edibles that might already be growing around you. Now for looks, I will start out with the leek. And most people don't think about leek as a uh, beautiful plant or as an ornamental plant. People think of a leek and potato soup. I think leeks are one of the most beautiful vegetables there is. And uh, if you look at the, um, the way the leaves come out from that central stalk, uh, at the very bottom, they're coming out almost at right angles, uh, about 45 degree angle midway up, and then even tighter angles near the top. But you get this beautiful architecture to the leek plant. And so uh, some falls, I'll take nice big leeks out of the veggie garden, put them in a planter as a centerpiece, and then around that plant some frilly parsley and colorful Swiss chard. And it really, really Now, um, another plant that I think just has a wonderful ornamental value, another vegetable, and uh, we're looking here at a runner bean, but while a lot of people know uh, scarlet runner beans, this is a, a variety that I just love called Painted Lady. And you can see uh, that I've had leeks, runner beans, these aren't necessarily uncommon things, but they, they have beautiful ornamental properties. Now the, the Painted Lady, this is it uh, maybe three or four years ago in my garden. I had made a teepee out of old branches and I put that under my apple tree. And to my delight, later in the season, the, um, the Painted Lady had grown right into the apple tree. And you can see, if you look closely at this picture, the, um, the, the flowers are mixed in with these beautiful green Matsu apples. And I love, I love that effect. And I've tried to reproduce it since, but it's never been as nice as that year that it happened by accident. Kale, another plant with wonderful, uh, wonderful ornamental properties. It's, it's stunningly beautiful. And this, by the way, is not in my vegetable garden. This is the um, seed trials of William Dam seeds. Uh, I haven't been growing as much kale as I used to. I, I had some good years and we ate quite a bit of kale. 
and uh, we ate quite a bit of kale until the day that I accidentally served it with the caterpillars still on it. And uh, we haven't eaten as much since. But here's another shot of kale. Uh, I did put some in that front yard garden that I was showing you. So a couple years back, I thought, oh, let's try some kale out front here, some ornamental ones. And this was the same year there was a new house going up next door to me with a very difficult contractor. Had the toilet, his portable toilet right beside my driveway, and I was all set to confront him one day about the smell of this thing. When he confronted me and he said, Steve, your yard stinks. And uh, it, it turns out it was my yard and it was my kale in which I had a rot that I hadn't noticed. Um, but having said that, kale, beautiful plant, uh, one of my favorites. So those were some ideas that uh, of edibles that you might want to grow for look. Lots more. It's all a, a matter of, of what you like. Let me come at edibles now from the angle of simple to grow. Now uh, I have here a picture that you're looking at of some young lettuce, some young dill, and and indeed both of these are simple to grow. But uh, what I would really like to share with you in this picture is that these are volunteer plants. Volunteer meaning that they've come up on their own from seeds that dropped the previous year. If you, uh, if you come from a farm background, you'll know that a volunteer crop is one that comes up from seed that fell off the crop the previous year. So if you look at a soybean field and you see a few stems of corn in there, that's volunteer corn coming up from corn that fell fell off during combining the previous year. And for a farmer, that's a weed. But in the vegetable garden, the uh, I think the volunteers are a great time saver. And often, they're very, uh, very far ahead of what we might plant ourselves. And so in my case, the volunteer lettuce and the volunteer dill are consistently up and growing before I get it planted and growing. So volunteers, a good way to make edible gardening simple. Garlic. Um, I'm excited about garlic because it is one of the few crops that as urban gardeners we can grow enough of and store to last for a whole season. Uh, garlic stores very well and if you have a decent cold cupboard you can grow enough and store enough for the whole season and, and I don't buy garlic. Currants. Uh, I'm a big fan of currants for simplicity. You're looking here at a red currant, and people say to me, oh, currants, how much red currant jelly can you eat? Um, but be assured that there are lots of things you can do with currants, um, from jellies through to uh, jams and chutneys, but my favorite is juice. And what I do is I freeze all of my currants, and, uh, and then I pull them out over the course of the winter and make batches of juice. And uh, from a half dozen good sized bushes, you can harvest a lot of fruit. Now, I'm talking about currants as a simple edible. So what's simple about them is that, uh, first of all, they're not fussy about soil. And um, I've grown currants in a very hard packed yellow clay that we have around here. They don't complain a bit. But the, the other thing is that they, uh, they will do decently in partial sun. And uh, so I put my currants in semi-shaded spots and they do very nicely. My former neighbors, Anna and Chris, had uh, this old currant bush growing right underneath an apple tree, an old red currant bush. Hadn't been pruned for years and nothing ever done to it, but it consistently fruited year after year. And I know that because I'm the person who would reach through the fence and take all of these red currants. So red currants, excellent choice leaves your best garden real estate free for the things that need the sun, that need the good soil, and the currants can take the partial sun and the less than perfect soil. I was at uh, Montreal Botanical Gardens a couple summers ago, and what did I see but currants being grown in the shade uh, of the fruit trees. And so I was delighted to see this because that just uh, drives home the point um, that they really are an excellent plant to use up that less than perfect garden real estate. This is my neighbor Chris's uh, Norway maple in his front yard. And uh, you can see here, there's a plant growing in the crotch of the tree. That's the wild currant or gooseberry. I'm not sure which, 
But uh, the fact that it grew there from a seed that a bird dropped really is testament to how hardy and how easy to grow these are. Now, cut current, and I like it for those same reasons, easy to grow and uh, not fussy about location. One thing you should know if you get into growing currants is that red currants and black currants are treated differently in the way that they're pruned, but they're both easy to grow and uh, both great choices for an urban garden, as is their cousin, the gooseberry. Now, people say to me, well, what about stemming your current? So much work. And I always jokingly say, oh, well, you know, child labor. Um, here's Emma, my daughter Emma, when she was a, a toddler, de-stemming currants for me. But on a more serious note, I mentioned that I freeze my red currants. And um, if you put all your currants and gooseberries in the freezer, stems and all, uh, when you pull them out, those stems are now brittle. And so you can uh, lay them out on a cookie sheet, rub them, and the stems will break off quite easily. So that's an easy way to de-stem your currants, your gooseberries. Here are the kids uh, after I told them, help me pick the currants, but maybe leave the gooseberries because of the thorns. The kids were all over that, and they, they picked all of the gooseberries for me, and uh, they also uh, ate a good portion of them as well. Now, elderberry. Uh, we're still talking about edibles that are simple to grow, good choices for urban areas, and elderberry is a wonderful choice. Now, this is a plant that will often you'll often see it growing wild um, in hedgerows up in farm country, and in fact, that's where I got my first elderberry plant, was from a friend's farm. You're looking now at the flowers. The, uh, the neat thing about this plant is that you can both the, uh, the flowers and the fruit are edible. And I've uh, made in the past elderflower champagne where you make a nice sparkling drink by uh, putting those flowers in with some water, lemon and sugar and getting a light fermentation. Some people will batter and uh, deep fry the flowers. And here's what the fruit looks like. I tend to use these for juice in the same way that I do my currants. Some people like elderberry pie. And um, they're, they're also good dried. You can uh, dry them and add them to tea. But in any case, it's an easy to grow edible that does well in urban areas. Uh, it does like sun, but I had mine in the driest, heaviest clay thinkable at my old house, and it did beautifully. So easy to grow. Now sorrel is another one of my easy to grow favorites. And if you don't know sorrel, it's a perennial. And the leaf has a sour flavor. I like to use it in salads mixed in with other greens. But uh, you can also think of sorrel as a lemon substitute for northerners. And what's neat about it is that when you put leaf pieces into a soup or into a stew, it cooks away into nothing. It just dissolves, melts right into what you're cooking. So really a wonderful, wonderful plant. And um, you don't often see this in stores. At some of the Russian uh, delis around here, I've found it canned and in brine, and uh, not very nice in my opinion. So it makes it very worthwhile growing sorrel. Now Swiss chard. This is my favorite green. And you're looking here at a, a multicolored um, mix of seeds that I planted. What's great about Swiss chard. It's really a hard-working plant. And if you grow lettuce, if you grow spinach, you know that when you get a hot spell in the summer, then the leaves pretty much stop growing, the plant goes to flower, and that's the end of your harvest. Swiss chard is a different beet. Uh, you see it has a two-year life cycle, so it doesn't try to flower in year one. It just wants to grow leaves all year long. So you keep cutting and they'll keep growing. And you can um, pick the leaves when they're very big and they have this um, big stalk in them, or you can harvest them as baby leaves and, and use them uncooked in a salad. So very versatile. And here it is in the fall. So another nice thing about Swiss chard is that it stands up to those nice light frosts and um, it actually looks pretty nice. I've, uh, I think it has great ornamental properties and there's a bit of frost painted on the Swiss chard here. As the sun comes off, that frost will burn away and the plant will spring right back up. 
Now, my claim to uh, Swiss chard fame is that I was on TV cooking Swiss chard. And here I am. I had a call from a healthy living show saying, uh, can you come and talk about veggie gardening? But it was late November, and I said, why don't we talk about cooking up some of these great fall veggies that do well in the fall garden, can be grown in the city, but a lot of people aren't familiar cooking. So I took in some beautiful big Swiss chard, uh, leeks, some sorrel. The sorrel was my lemon substitute. Cooked them all up and put them in a phyllo pastry to make a spanakopita-like pastry. And uh, so I hope I converted a few gardeners or non-gardeners into uh, trying Swiss chard. And uh, I, I was a little bit shaky when I was on there. I was nervous, but I'd made sure to pre-cut as much of the veg as I could so that I wouldn't have any on-air accidents with the knife. So Swiss chard. Now, we're looking here onion and um, onion sets are another very simple edible that you can consider growing little bulbs that are pre-grown you stick them in the ground and they grow into you can harvest them as green onions or you can let them grow into to bulbs this is my daughter emma putting them in and uh, onion sets are a good choice for demarcating a kid's garden you know kids like to define their space and uh, so very often we'll take some onion sets and make a little border around the kids' garden. Asparagus, another simple to grow edible. And uh, you'll see here I've got a purple asparagus on the left, a green one on the right. There is a purple one a variety out there. I'm a, a big fan of veggies with unusual colors because to me it makes it fun. And uh, gardening has to be fun. Now, um, why is asparagus? a good easy to grow choice it's because it's a perennial so once you have it established it comes back year after year after year and the other thing I like about asparagus though is its ornamental properties so on the right here you're looking at some asparagus ferns and that's what grows after you finished harvesting those asparagus spears in the spring the ferns are tall they, they flop over a bit so they're best at the back of a garden but this is a good case where you could easily mix some asparagus into a perennial border and have it at the back. So mix your ornamentals, mix your edibles. Now, let's uh, look at a couple ideas of edibles that are just plain fun to grow. Because after all, gardening has to be fun, and if we're going to grow new gardeners, we need to make it a lot of fun. So first of all, let's look at that Promethean plant that I was telling you about, that plant that was unusual enough, that bold and daring plant that had my neighbor leaving me a message. So here it is uh, with my daughter Emma standing beside it. This is the cardoon. And if you don't know the cardoon, it's uh, related to the globe artichoke. And, um, but with the globe artichoke, we're eating the, the, the flower bud. And with the cardoon, you're eating the rib on the leaf. Now, I had this beautiful planting of them in my front yard. They were all along the driveway with these big, bold, arching leaves. They almost looked like sentries that were guarding the garden from the driveway. Really beautiful. But I've been telling my wife, Shelley, that, hey, I'll cook those up one night into a gourmet meal. And so I did a lot of reading, found out that some people compare the taste to asparagus. Some people say it's a little bit celery-like. Some people suggested a gratin cheese-like sauce and so I, um, I cooked it up and I said to Shelly here you go I plated it up beautifully poured the red wine we each took a bite and then we looked at each other in absolute horror because it truly was revolting it was awful uh, inedible and uh, so I recounted this at a talk that I gave uh, a little while after and a fellow came up to me after he said hey I can help you I'm a chef by training and what you need to do with cardoon or things like it that have a bitterness is change the water when you're boiling it. Change the water part way through and also add some salt. And so um, I did and it was better but uh, quite frankly the, um, the best way to prepare it is to deep fry it. I cut it into little sections, breaded it, deep fried it, served it with a garlic sauce and that was really nice. Here's Cardoon in the fall. So like the Swiss chard, it takes those light frosts, it gets painted with frost, and then it'll spring back up during the day when the sun comes out. So it looks really, really nice in the fall garden. Here you can see it with some 
ornamental kale, and uh, just a strikingly beautiful plant. Now this is Malabar spinach. Uh, this is a, a, a really fun edible, really beautiful, always gets comments from visitors to my garden. And you can see that it has these beautiful purpley red stems and that the flower buds are tinged with color. The leaves have a nice heart shape. And what you can do with this is chop up the leaves and, the, and pieces of the stem and use them in a stir fry. So Malabar spinach, it also comes in a uh, variety that is green, no red, and so uh, you can mix and match. Here it is growing up the, the cedar post, that cedar post in front of my front yard garden that I was so nervous about. And uh, here it is on a rooftop garden, so it does well in a container. You can see here how the, um, with the back lighting, how that red really jumps out and it's very beautiful. Malabar spinach. Now, dahlias. I was touring a market garden north of Toronto, saw a patch of dahlias, and I said to David, the farmer, I said, David, are you growing cut flowers now? And he said, oh, no. He said, I sell dahlias to high-end restaurants in Toronto. I was, I was really surprised. I'd never heard that dahlias were edible up to that point. And, uh, but anyway, David had been a chef. And so he went on to explain to me in his, in, in his chef's lingo, the taste, how the dahlia tubers have the um, brightness of uh, ginger and the earthiness of celery root. I thought I was the only garden writer going around talking about dahlias until a couple years ago. I was at an event and uh, there's a, a garden writer, um, Marjorie Mason, in the um, Toronto area who was giving a talk and she talked about her dahlia bread where instead of uh, grating up zucchini and making a zucchini bread, she grates up dahlia tubers and makes a dahlia bread. So dahlias as a fun addition to the edible garden. Now tomatoes. Um, now tomatoes might seem a strange choice for fun crops because after all so many people grow tomatoes, but I'm not talking about the big round red tomatoes. I like to try some unusual ones. And um, one of my favorites is uh, a tomato I call the winter tomato. I call it Dino's winter tomato because my dad's friend Dino gave, it, uh, gave us the seeds. It came from his family who presumably brought it from Italy. And it's a very unassuming tomato. Um, not that big. It's like one of the cluster tomatoes. It's orangey colored and hard as a rock. But this is a really fun tomato because it keeps. And I picked them all before that first frost, which is in October usually around here. Put them all in the cold room and I can keep pulling out these tomatoes as they ripen and using them. And I'll be, I'm using some now. I made a bruschetta last night and I'll have them over the, over the holidays and right into January. So excellent keeper. And uh, that makes it very fun for me because I can say to my company, hey, you are eating a fresh tomato out of my garden, and um, and that makes it a lot of fun. Mexican sour gherkins, another very fun choice. And what makes it fun, I think, is the novelty. But these, you can see from the picture, are smaller than a loony. They look like little watermelons. They're cucumber relatives. And uh, these ones are a big hit with my kids. Uh, lots of fun, uh, crunchy, a little bit sour. And um, the other name is mouse melon. Now, after the uh, initial success, the kids in the next year implanted twice as many. And we had oodles. We had far more than we could eat. And so what I decided to do was I pulled out the crock and uh, threw a bunch of them in the crock with a bit of garlic and dill and salt and water. And uh, they made a beautiful pickle. So pretty versatile Mexican sour gherkin or mouse melon. And don't forget to try things that have different colors. Uh, to me, color novelty makes things a lot of fun. And so, for example, I have here a picture of yellow raspberries, um, a purple bean. You might not know, but when you cook purple beans, they become green. So I'm a big fan of using purple beans uncooked on a veggie platter. They look beautiful. And um, what's neat about the variety that you see in the picture here, it's called purple peacock. And um, pole beans are very often 
more flat uh, than the uh, the bush beans, and you can see this is a fairly flat bean. So if you have that on a veggie platter with dip, you can scoop up a lot more dip with this sort of bean than you could uh, with a normal bush bean. Okay, let's um, look at edibles now. Uh, growing edibles in tight spots. If you don't have a lot of space, how are you going to get edibles into your garden? And um, well, for me, the obvious way is to mix up edibles and ornamentals. And here we're looking at a picture of zinnias in front of some corn. Corn is a beautiful centerpiece. It has the height. Uh, it has the, um, the, the beautiful flowers, later tassels. And uh, so it can be a, a very beautiful combination. Another idea, here's some nice curly parsley beside some New Guinean patience. Very beautiful. And don't forget to use up space that maybe other people aren't gardening on. So in this case, uh, this is a picture that um, was sent in for a contest a couple of years ago in Toronto. And it was all about balcony gardening and, and use, making good use of limited space. And here somebody's taken some shoe bags and is growing strawberries and flowers on a brick wall. And I just love that. I love the creativity of, of using that otherwise unused space. How else can we fit edibles uh, into our garden when we don't have a lot of space? Well, this is one of my composters. And um, you can see there's soil on top. So we're looking at it in the spring. In the fall, I filled it with leaves. In the spring, I topped it up with leaves and a bit of straw. And then I capped it with soil, so six inches to a foot of soil. And then I garden on top of there. And uh, so this makes great use of a space that otherwise would go unused for gardening. Gardening on top of a composter. I've also gardened on top of this sort of composter, one of these municipally issued ones. And uh, if you fill it right up, put a cap of soil on top of there, you can grow a nice crop in there. It's, uh, it's black, so you're going to have a very nice warm root zone for the plant, as well as any decomposition in there. Just the fact that it's black will, uh, will make it nice and warm. And uh, the other thing to think, and think about in this kind of uh, situation is that you're tiering your garden. You're growing at two different heights, at two different levels. And um, tiering your garden is often a great way to squeeze more into a small space. Here are my kids helping me fill one of the uh, leaf composters in the fall. We have uh, a lot of silver maples around our area. So there's always lots of leaves on my property. And I often solicit them from my neighbors. And um, we put them in the composter. We put in layers of soil, more leaves. And over the winter, here we're looking at it with a little sprinkling of snow, over the winter those leaves do start to settle down. And, um, and they'll settle down quite a bit more by springtime. But I've always uh, stashed away a few that I top, top this up with before putting a soil cap on there. Now, you might be wondering, so if you're growing veggies on your composter, then how do you still compost in the summer? And uh, the answer to that is, well, you just have more than one composter. And um, the other question that people often ask me is, so if you're growing veggies on there, how do you turn your compost? And I don't. Uh, I am a lazy gardener when it comes to turning compost. Uh, I've never enjoyed doing that. And so instead, I grow veggies on top of it. And what I do do, though, is I have a long broom handle. And I poke holes to the bottom of that pile. Every so often, I'll just go in and poke in a bunch of holes, vertical holes. And what that does is it allows air to get to the bottom of that composter. And it, uh, it speeds up the decomposition of those leaves. Now, this probably isn't giving me the same quality of compost or same speed that I might get if I really manage that compost pile and balance my browns and my greens. But that's OK. I'm still getting lots of good compost, and I'm getting extra garden space by gardening on top. Now, I do get the question, uh, so uh, I don't get enough compost in my garden. What should I do? And uh, buy compost. Um, I'm a big fan of compost. There's nothing wrong with buying compost. And um, I'm excited because the Compost Council of Canada has now been working with its members for a program. And uh, this program 
is the Compost Quality Alliance. And what they've done is they've set up some standards uh, above and beyond what's required uh, by government regulations to give a very high quality compost product. And, and I can't help but thinking it's a little bit like uh, here in Ontario, they have the VQA for wines, the Vintners Quality Alliance. And uh, when you see that on the wine, you think, oh, that's a, a good wine. And so I think this is maybe the, uh, the equivalent in the world of compost, Compost Quality Alliance. Now, continuing on with gardening in tight spaces, uh, this is my garage roof. And uh, I kept looking at it thinking what a wasted space it was and what an ugly space it was. And so I set about to put a garden up there. I uh, used pots because I was conscious of cost. And um, it was a fabulous, fabulous space to garden. The heat on this kind of roof, the radiated heat, was amazing. So uh, wonderful crops of melons eggplant, okra, all of those heat-loving crops did phenomenally well. The, uh, the one big lesson I learned is that it's a nice hot microclimate. That also means that the pots dry out quickly. And so year number two, I put reservoirs in the bottom of the pot. And um, watering cut back at least in half. And the plants did better yet from that constantly available supply of water. So if you are looking at gardening in containers, do keep that in mind. Now, you don't need a flat garage roof to do this kind of thing. Uh, you could easily do this on a patio, on a driveway. Um, maybe just pick containers that are a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. In this case, they were out of sight, so the black plastic was fine. But certainly, you can pick nicer looking ones. You might also want to consider this type of uh, container growing in a spot right on the ground. Sometimes when you have a hedge, uh, you might have a, a hedge on the north side of a property. So you have good light, but you have this hard packed soil full of roots that prevents you from growing edibles. Well, con consider putting containers there, and that's a good way to make that space usable. Here's one of the uh, melons from my rooftop garden, a beautiful French Charente melon, a very aromatic melon, beautiful orange color. So uh, a wonderful space to garden. This is my friend Joanne's rooftop garden. She has about 500 square feet. This is in Midtown Toronto. And uh, you can see it's very well laid out, very well planned. And uh, Joanne has everything growing up there. Her tomatoes are a couple of weeks ahead of mine. And the, um, the fun thing is there is no door to this rooftop garden. And the first time uh, Joanne showed it to me, I was quite surprised when we went upstairs and then climbed out of her bathroom window to get onto this rooftop garden. Very productive. Another rooftop garden, I visited this in uh, Quebec City a couple of years ago, Le Jardin de l'Aubrivière. And uh, it's uh, run by a group called Urban Couture and a fabulous garden. Here you can see uh, they're using the fabric pots. And uh, that's pretty much all they were using on the rooftop was these fabric pots, which they found were working extremely well because um, they, they stood up very well, um, also uh, easy to get up onto the roof before filling them. So uh, working well. And in this garden, what really struck me was the variety of things that they had. So you can see in the foreground here some tomatoes. Uh, but they had uh, bushes too. They had currant bushes. They had elderberry bushes. They had um, melons. They had, uh, you can see here, some horseradish in the foreground. They had the best celery I've ever seen growing on a rooftop. And so um, look out. If, you, if you're tight for space, look out for some of these spaces that might be around you where you can garden because you don't need um, high tech. In the case of my garage roof, I'm um, not sure about the um, weight, weight load I could put on it. I chose the pots, and then I would uh, take those off in the winter, uh, assuming that uh, a roof is engineered to withstand some snow load in the winter so I can use some of that capacity in the summer. Now, uh, here we're jumping back to my front yard, my front yard garden. And this is inside the spruce tree that you might have noticed at the back of the picture. We're looking at a trumbetta summer school squash, which is a beautiful vining squash. 
and uh, one day as I was checking my garden, I found this thing growing inside the spruce tree. And I thought, hmm, isn't that neat? I must tell people about that if they're gardening in small spaces. Remember to grow on trees, and in this case, inside the tree. And uh, this got me thinking about something that had happened to me a few years before. And uh, here's what I looked like before I had long hair. And, uh, and what I'm looking at here, what I'm beside, is my cedar hedge. And I found a dozen squash studded in the hedge. And that particular summer, the uh, squash plants had um, gone out of control, and I just let them do their thing. They covered the back cedar hedge. And in August, when those leaves were covered with powdery mildew, I started thinking about pulling them off. But lo and behold, a dozen squash studded in the hedge. So if you're tight for space, consider growing squash up a hedge, up a tree. And it does work. Now here you're looking at um, tomatoes, baked tomatoes with some young lettuce seedlings underneath. And what I do is when I put in my tomatoes is I'll sprinkle lettuce seed around the base. And, uh, and so that's what you see growing here. And why this works well is that in the summer, lettuce doesn't really want to be in full sun, full heat. And uh, when you get into the summer, this tomato will have grown higher and the lettuce is growing in the semi-shade underneath. So it's, it's a good use of space. You're using up any open soil, any bare patches underneath your tomatoes. And, and when you have small spaces, you really do need to squeeze as much into a small space as you can. Um, continuing on with that same thought, here you're looking at some carrots interplanted with some radish. And you can see them on the left when they're young. And on the right, you can see them when those radish have grown big enough to harvest. The radish grows more quickly than the carrot. And so when you pull those radishes out, those spindly little carrots will get a chance to grow. The radish has a nice taproot. And so as you're pulling it out, um, you're aerating the soil and leaving a nice channel where that taproot was for air and water to get in the soil. So it's a system that works very well. You can do that with beets and radish too. Those are a couple of my favorite pairings. Now, uh, let's come back to the theme that we started out with, which is gardening out front. Front yards, gardens, and um, here's that front yard garden of mine. Here's Emma beside our giant sunflowers. And what was very gratifying about these was that my neighbor Kathy uh, across the street immaculate house. I was worried about having a different style of garden than them. Well, she was really excited about these sunflowers and she phoned a couple of times to say, oh, look how high those are. When do you think they'll bloom? It was a real success. Now, I was delighted when I was in Quebec City a couple summers ago and they had edibles in front of the National Assembly, in front of their provincial parliament. And you can see here the corn stalk. You can see here some cabbages, and in the background, I think, are some uh, zucchini or squash. Here's some kale with some grapevines in behind it. And there were all sorts of other edibles, too, including um, small fruit in containers. And I was told that this was, as well as being a beautiful display, and it really was beautiful. They made it look very nice, but as well as looking nice, that the intent behind this was to send a message that, hey, it's okay to grow edibles, and it's okay if people see them. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. So it, a message that I love because I really embrace that. Now, this uh, garden I was telling you about, uh, this vacant lot that they turned into a garden near me, the Parkview Neighborhood Garden, uh, it's been a wonderful story because the garden has flourished, uh, lots of community involvement. And on the right, you'll see beside the sign, there's what looks like a vacant lot. And in fact, this has been such a success that the city bought up the house next door, tore it down, and doubled the size of the garden. So, um, so much for neighborhood opposition to vegetables, because uh, these truly are uh, growing in plain sight. And, and it looks great. Now, if at this point I haven't uh, got you excited about edibles, growing edibles that look good or simple or fun, are good for small spaces, then let's talk about some edibles that are maybe already out there in the urban landscape right around you, because there are a lot. Uh, one of my favorites is serviceberry. This is widely planted in the Toronto Park system. 
In fact, it's not just one um, plant, it's a whole family of related plants. There's um, bushes, small trees, they all have these berries. And um, in addition to the berries being edible though, it has great ornamental properties and it turns the leaves turn a beautiful orange in the fall and the bark on these trunks as they get bigger is really beautiful. It's, it's like elephant skin, this beautiful gray bark. So an edible with great ornamental properties, service berry. And I've seen people in our parks here uh, in the service berry season walking around with little containers picking them. But you have to beat the birds to them. Mountain ash. Um, I've uh, seen mountain ash or rowan berry jam. My dad once made uh, wine out of it, which was a uh, beautiful color, beautiful, beautiful amber color. Um, tasted quite horrid, so I don't recommend wine. But uh, these grow all over the place, and um, some people will eat them. Uh, this is the black walnut tree in my next door neighbor's yard. I was horrified when I realized what it is, because um, we bought in the winter. There were no leaves on this. I didn't pay much attention to it. And I found out that this tree next door is a black walnut. And what that means is these things give off a toxin. I can't grow tomato family plants anywhere near it because it kills them. So I got thinking, well, at least if I can't grow tomatoes, I'll enjoy some of the, the nuts. And so uh, you might find nuts as something that you can um, harvest in the city. And, and by the way, um, I, took the, I dehusked these without wearing gloves. And if you haven't done this before, be warned that they, um, they stain. My very white hands became very brown for a couple of weeks after I husked my walnut. And I was uh, mentioning this at a talk I gave and someone came up to me and said, oh, when we were kids, uh, our parents would just pile up the walnuts and let those husks rot a bit. And then they would dress us up in old clothes and rubber boots and we could go stomp on the pile and dehusk the walnuts. And certainly that sounds like a, a better process to me than what I did. Dandelions. Uh, most people know dandelions as an edible that grows everywhere in, in urban areas. And I love spring dandelion greens wilted in the skillet with a bit of garlic and sour cream. Um, very, very uh, readily available everywhere. And what I don't recommend though is I did try roasting the roots once. I'd read that you can roast these roots and make a coffee-like substitute. And definitely I'll stick with the greens, not the roots. And we come back to the cardoon where we started, that promethean, that bold, that daring plant. And uh, one of many plants, that uh, edible plants, that we can grow in urban areas. And um, there, there's so many plants, so many ways we can grow them in our urban spaces. But to me, it's important that it be fun and um, it's a wonderful way to reach out to our neighbors. And so with that, I'm going to uh, take questions now. I'll leave you with my contact information. And uh, if you have questions now or at a later time, you can feel free to reach out to me by phone, by email, or through one of the websites. Oh, thank you, Stephen, for that presentation. It's Jolene here. So um, if anyone does have a question, be sure to uh, type it in. Otherwise, raise your hand so that you can uh, ask the question yourself. Um, I haven't got any so far, so I'm just going to go ahead and ask my own. So mm -hmm. I understand you do some garden writing and you talk to people. Uh, what is the reception that you get when you tell them about using compost and, and what are the main benefits that uh, maybe people don't realize um, that adding compost to the soil, how that can improve the soil health? Well, you know, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity for people to learn about compost because people very often think of uh, soil as this disposable entity. We live in a throwaway society, so people just think, oh, well, I'll just buy a whole new batch of soil for my garden, instead of thinking, wow, I could use compost to make my garden better. So I think there's a, a big opportunity to, um, to get people to think about compost 
and uh, and change the way they think about soil instead of it being this disposable thing that people want to get rid of they should think of it as being their soil and let's grow this soil using compost and is there anything in particular any messages that you you know it's not just the nutrients in the compost but uh, are people surprised by other benefits from the compost uh, for example, the diversity of the microorganisms or um, adding that or soil organic matter and, and the benefits that can come from there? I think um, a lot of new gardeners have very little idea about that. And, and so that's where as garden communicators we have so much opportunity because we can show people how much is going on in the soil. It's not just this, it's not just dirt. Uh, there's all of these microbes, there's worms, there's organic matter, sand, silt, clay, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another question here from Richard, <coughs> pardon me, from Richard Joswiak. Um, do you use compost made from biosolids or sewage sludge, and would you promote its use? I don't know that I ever have used it. Uh, from from biosolids or sewage sludge, and I don't know a whole lot about it. So, um, Richard, I, is I, that, I assume then that's also the the general. Um, For example, there's I just know not enough information about the different types of organic uh, amendments that can be added from a public perception. I didn't catch that. Can you repeat that, Jolene? Sorry. Um, so is it or of different um, organic amendments that can be, or not necessarily organic in the organic term, but um, soil amendments that can be added that aren't necessarily synthetically based? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just the knowledge and what the differences are and that they are safe to use. Uh, generally Ooh. unknown? People are surprised when I talk to them about shrimp compost. I grew uh, one of my shrimp compost and, and you'll see people's faces light up and they'll say, what do you mean shrimp compost? And, uh, and it's great because that opens up the discussion of, well, hey, you know, all this waste from seafood processing plants can be turned into this beautiful uh, rich compost so um, yeah okay okay um, some other gardening questions from Kathleen Barsom how to get started on planning for a front yard garden are there some design plans that you recommend or resources to get them I think like any garden you could take it so many different ways of gardening. A garden goes into a garden that might already be there. In my case, I decided for the first couple of years, I just wanted all edibles to make a bit of a statement. But I, I would start there, and in terms of the, the layout or the style, that's a very personal thing. But um, in, in keeping with our discussion today, of course, you want to look at that soil too, and, and see add lots of compost and, and get that soil up to uh, up to the level it needs to be at. Okay, and a question from Pascal Provost. Um, can you list some? pairing I have is, is the one that I showed there which was the carrots and the radishes and um, I'm not uh, putting them together as companions for any pest fighting reason it, it's more a practical reason to squeeze them into a tight space as I said um, and in terms of natural pollinators um, yeah I mean I'm 
I don't believe in this segregation in the garden. I know some people want natural natives in one corner and veggies in another, but I'm big on mixing it up. So this year we we put some milkweed in the garden, some butterfly milkweed, and why can't it be right beside the veggies? There's no reason it needs to be separate. Are there some resource books that you would recommend for people uh, regarding companion planting? Uh, I don't off the top of my head have a resource to recommend, no. Okay, well, I haven't got any more questions. So uh, with that, if you have any closing statements, um, but uh, on behalf of Green Manitoba, we're very thankful that you were able to give this presentation. And we have at least six more months before I can even think about going into the soil but here from Manitoba. But uh, definitely gave me some good ideas um, and, and got me excited about getting back into the garden come spring. That's good. Well, uh, just to close, uh, Grow lots of edibles in your city gardens. Uh, it's a great way to meet neighbors. It's a great way to educate people. And uh, thank you for the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for all your time and your care, Stephen. And uh, thank you for your help, Jolene. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. Take care. Bye.